So in this video we're going to look at three topics related to aircraft. We have addressed them in the past on my channel and also several other flat earth debunking channels. However, it seems there are still flat earthers out there who are just not keeping up and they are still talking about these subjects. Let's have a look at the first one, flight tracking software. So we're now looking at the map screen on a site called Flight Radar 24 and as you can see there are still plenty of aircraft flying around the world. The aircraft in yellow are being tracked through conventional ADS-B ground receivers but those in blue are being tracked by the more modern space-based ADS-B. If you click on one of these you can see what the aircraft is, United Airlines 2846 from San Francisco to Guam and if you scroll down you can see that the data source is from the satellite and you will see updates to the latitude and longitude quite regularly. You can see that's changing every few seconds. Any of these aircraft in blue are tracked continually via satellite. This one is from Doha to Melbourne. Now this satellite tracking capability has existed for several months. In fact, I did a video of it back in March 13 this year showing Qantas Flight 28 from Santiago to Sydney, also being tracked by a satellite, confirming that its path goes well south of the origin and the destination. That is because it is flying close to the Great Circle Route, which is the shortest distance on a globe. So the main argument Flat Earth has had with these sites is that the aircraft can no longer be tracked once they are more than a few hundred miles off land. If the data source is only land-based ADS-B receivers, that is correct. However, we now have Arion space-based ADS-B and therefore aircraft can be tracked in the middle of the ocean just fine. So remember, these tracking sites are free. They don't cost you anything. And like most things in life, you get what you pay for. They have introduced satellite-based tracking recently, but in the business world, we've had it for a long time. Through a company called Satcom Direct, we have been able to track our aircraft in real time for many years. They also provide the onboard internet capability which gives us coverage virtually everywhere we fly. This is the range map for the satellite based Wi-Fi and you can see by these patterns that they are clearly coming from geostationary satellites and cover most parts of the Earth you would likely be flying, including the Indian Ocean and the South Pacific. We flew from Christchurch across to Argentina in 2016 heading to Rio for the Olympics we had internet coverage the whole way. I'll talk a little more about that trip shortly. So the claim flat earthers make about aircraft not being tracked over water is no longer valid. With satellite based ADS-B we certainly can track aircraft over the oceans and if you were prepared to pay for the service that capability has been around for many years. Point number two, actual GPS track logs. So recently I watched a video with a number of flat earthers asking to see actual data confirming the flight paths of these aircraft over water. Now I'm not sure if they've been living under a rock for the last few years, but I started making flat earth debunking videos back in August 2016. By the end of that year, I had already posted a number of GPS log files from my own Pacific crossings. Here is one on the 17th of December 2016 GPS worked fine all the way from Australia to Hawaii and that was in my own aircraft. On the return trip I came home with Qantas on QF8 from Dallas to Sydney again recording the GPS track log during the flight and this video shows the two bad elf units that I used. Additionally in December 2016 I posted this video Flat Earth non-stop flight Rio Brazil to Cape Town Africa, a GPS log analysis. That was on our return trip from the Rio Olympics back to Australia. 
So this video was public for a while and then I decided to make it unlisted. It is an easy checkmate for those times when flat earthers accuse me of never having flown the non-stop southern routes myself. I simply post a link to this video and the GPS track log and the flat earther usually disappears. So this is Google Earth and what I have done is plot a line in yellow showing the path we took flying from Australia to Rio, Brazil in August 2016 for the Olympic Games. We departed Sydney and flew to Christchurch, New Zealand, where we refuelled and picked up an additional passenger. From there, we flew across the South Pacific, intending to fly to Santiago, but due to fog, we had to divert to Mendoza in Argentina. After a short refuel and clearing customs, we continued up to Rio in Brazil. And that was the only time we were north of the Tropic of Capricorn for the entire trip. Three weeks later, we returned to Australia, continuing east from Rio, non-stop to Cape Town, Africa, refuelled, continued on to Perth in Australia, refuelled, dropped off one passenger and continued to Sydney. And that was actually the last time I have flown a full circumnavigation of the Earth. As you can see, it was entirely in the Southern Hemisphere and the majority of it was south of the Tropic of Capricorn. Here's a short video from Rio just proving that I was there for the Olympics. I'm just in Rio and this is uh, Copacabana Beach and the security presence here is just incredible for the Olympics. I've counted uh, eight helicopters patrolling back and forth. Some are at uh, medium level, some are going up and down and uh, there's a couple below the horizon level as I can see it from my hotel room. So uh, I can understand why they've got uh, no fly zones here. plus a couple of uh, Navy vessels, which are constantly patrolling back and forth along the beach as well. There's another helicopter further out there. Never seen anything like it. And there's uh, Christ the Redeemer up on the hill. Not sure if you can see it in the video. Looks good at night when it's all lit up. So I'll post a link to this GPS track log file in the description below. If you have Google Earth installed on your computer, just double clicking on the file should load it into the map and you can see the GPS log like this. You will have a slider bar that allows you to see the position of the aircraft at any given time. If you turn on the daylight and darkness, you can also see where the aircraft was in relation to the sunrise or the sunset. And here, as we were approaching Africa, we were just arriving in the early morning. If you zoom right in, the GPS log is accurate enough to see the short vector we had and the position around onto final for the landing. So these Bad Elf GPS units are not expensive. Anybody can buy one. And if you have a window seat on a commercial airliner, you will generally have good reception throughout the entire flight. So for many years, there was nothing stopping any flat earther from taking one of these southern trips, Sydney to San Diego or Sydney to Johannesburg with a Bad Elf GPS unit and obtain the log themselves. What makes it even funnier is that I offered a number of flat earthers these trips for free at my cost. I invited them to Australia to take the Sydney to San Diego flight or the Sydney to Johannesburg flight and I even offered to throw in a free Bad Elf GPS. There were no takers. Not one flat earther accepted that very genuine offer. When I made the same offer to a Glober, Greater Sapien, he did not hesitate. He came to Australia, he took the trips and he went home with a new Bad Elf GPS unit.
And the third point we're going to look at is how aircraft adjust for Coriolis. I have addressed this a number of times already, but let's look at a specific scenario flying from the equator to the North Pole, directly along a single line of longitude. At the equator, due to the rotation of the Earth, the tangential speed is 1036 miles per hour. At 45 degrees north latitude, it is 733 miles per hour. You get that number by taking the cosine of the latitude and multiplying it by 1036. At the pole, it is clearly zero. So the flat earth question is, how does the aircraft compensate for this 1036 mile per hour inertia dropping down to zero at the poles? And you must remember that this does not occur in the space of minutes. A flight from the equator to the North Pole takes around 12 hours at 450 knots, which is a typical speed for an airliner. So 12 hours to change its tangential velocity by 1036 miles per hour is quite small when you break it down to how much is required per minute. So looking at this on a globe, here we have the equator, and we're looking at the anti-meridian, the line of longitude that is directly opposite the prime meridian. If we were flying directly north, wishing to remain on the anti-meridian, the aircraft will be constantly making corrections as required to keep that track. This is the part that flat earthers overlook. The aircraft does not simply hold a heading of north and hope for the best. It is actively adjusting its heading as required to fly a precise ground track. Let's look at this another way. So let's imagine we're flying our aircraft and we have no navigation instruments at all. However, what we do have are boats spaced every 10 miles apart precisely on that anti-meridian. And we're going to navigate simply by following the line of boats. When we depart the equator, we're going to aim for the first boat 10 miles away. When we reach that boat, we have already made whatever adjustment is necessary for the wind and for the Coriolis. We then look for the second boat and we fly to that one. When we reach the second boat, we have adjusted for wind and Coriolis and we continue every 10 miles flying directly to the next boat. When we reach the fourth or the fifth or the tenth boat, we have already adjusted for any change in the tangential speed of the earth that is behind us. So there is only the next boat we need to worry about and the next one and the next one. And by the time we get up to the pole, we have adjusted for the majority of that Coriolis by simply making heading corrections to fly over each subsequent boat. During the last 10 miles, there is a small correction required and we fly over the boat that is at the North Pole. Now clearly that would work and depending upon the amount of wind, we would have to make corrections either to the left or to the right. But by simply correcting to fly over each subsequent boat, we have compensated for the Coriolis. And remember, that will take 12 hours to go from the equator to the pole. Plenty of time to make a very tiny adjustment every minute. So clearly when we fly, we're not following boats across the ocean, but we are following a precise ground track. The aircraft flight management system knows exactly where it is in relation to the surface of the Earth. And it does that with the inertial reference systems and with GPS. It is constantly flying to maintain a steady line across the ground. So this adjustment in the tangential speed flying from the equator to the poles is corrected by the corrections necessary to maintain a precise ground track. I have covered it. In this video, the Coriolis effect is no problem for aircraft if you catch my drift. I show the aircraft correcting for a very strong crosswind. 140 knots of crosswind, which is causing 19 degrees of drift. The ground track is 203 degrees, 
The aircraft heading is 221 degrees. It is compensating easily for a 140 knot crosswind. When we're trying to change 1036 miles per hour over 12 hours, that adjustment is insignificant compared to this 140 knot crosswind. As you can see, the cross track error is just 0.01 nautical miles. That is about 60 feet, less than the wingspan of the aircraft. So the aircraft has no trouble at all compensating for strong crosswinds. The tiny amount of adjustment for Coriolis each minute of flight is insignificant.